Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, with you. We have a really great program prepared and uh, we will definitely make sure there's time for questions at the end. So uh, make sure to, to bring your questions for our, for our panelists. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Dwayne Compton. I'm the Dean at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the, our moderator today who will be Dr. Steve Leach. Steve is the director of the Norris Cotton Cancer Center and the Preston T. and Virginia R. Kelsey Distinguished Chair in Cancer. So Steve joined the Cancer Center in Dartmouth almost three years ago, and he has, has laid out a very bold strategic plan for our Cancer Center and how to elevate its impact uh, in our region for cancer care and cancer patients, as well as across the world through advances and innovations in cancer research and implementation. I think we must start, Steve and I must start by taking this opportunity to recognize Ken and Carol Wegg for their extraordinary generosity and commitment to cancer research at Dartmouth and Dartmouth-Hitchcock. So the, the celebration today is a celebration of the generosity of Ken and Carol. So I thank you so much for doing that. They have been loyal and longtime supporters and advisors to our cancer center. And today we are celebrating the establishment of a distinguished professorship that will carry their name. We are also able to celebrate the appointment of the inaugural chairholder for this position. And that will be Dr. Scott Gerber. And he's going to give you a presentation on his work in just a few moments. So thank you very much, Ken and Carol, for everything you, you've done for your visionary support and generosity to our investigators and our cancer center. And congratulations to Scott for this new appointment and milestone achievement. So let me turn it over to, to Steve to be serve as our moderator for today's activities. Uh, thanks uh, very, very much, uh, Dwayne. And I personally want uh, to welcome uh, Ken and Carol and uh, the great uh, Dartmouth class of 1960 and all the other friends of our Cancer Center who are joining us uh, for today's webinar. I'm also um, incredibly grateful to Ken and Carol for their leadership, their guidance, and their support. Their contributions um, have been and will continue to be invaluable to me and to the physicians and scientists who make up our great uh, cancer center. And I also wanna thank all our donors who have given to our cancer center in support of our scientists and the important work that they uh, do. We're especially grateful to those who've helped establish um, endowed professorships like the one we're celebrating uh, today. I'm honored to hold the Preston T. and Virginia R. Kelsey Distinguished Chair in Cancer and Mary Jo Turk, whom you'll also hear from today, uh, holds the O. Ross McIntyre MD Professorship uh, here at the Geisel School of Medicine. And thank you, Duane, uh, for joining us uh, uh, today. I'd now like to transition into the main portion of our program. Um, and we're very excited that today you will be um, hearing some of the latest scientific advances uh, around uh, cancer prevention and cancer treatment, as well as our vision for how our cancer center can have the greatest impact on patients, not just here in Northern New England, but literally uh, around the world. And I know you're all eager to hear from our speakers so I'll just take one more minute to run a few, a th a few a through, through a few housekeeping uh, items. Um, we really want to um, um, uh, hear from your questions, and please submit these uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of uh, the Zoom window. Uh, um, and if you see a question that interests you, submitted by someone else or yourself, you can click the thumbs up uh, to vote that question up in the Q&A queue. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can. Uh, please reserve use of the chat box for any technical challenges that you might experience. We've got technical webinar experts um, uh, on standby to, to help you negotiate any technical pitfalls. And um, uh, the webinar is being recorded today and will be made available to all attendees after uh, today's session. So without any further uh, ado, it is really my pleasure 
uh, to introduce my dear colleague, Scott Gerber, who is the inaugural Kenneth E. and Carol L. Wegg Distinguished Professor at the Geisel School of Medicine and also a co-director of our Cancer uh, Biology and Therapeutics Research Program within the Cancer Center. Take it away, Scott. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. Um, Steve, I'd also like to thank you for this uh, very visible and, and elevated recognition of my lab's commitment to cancer research and, and mentorship. Uh, it's the honor of my career so far to be recognized so prominently and, and um, with uh, such visibility among many other smart and diligent uh, colleagues doing amazing work here at the Norris Cotton Cancer Center. So uh, to be singled out from among them is, is quite an honor. So thank you. I'm also so incredibly grateful to, to Carol and, and Ken Wegg for their steadfast commitment to battling cancer through generous and longstanding partnership with Dartmouth and the Cancer Center. And it's my hope someday to meet the Wegg family so that I can share that gratitude in person, as I'm sure um, this Zoom seminar isn't, isn't going to do it justice. So um, until that day, uh, a heartfelt thank you to you both. I'd like to start with a brief introduction as to how I got here. So I studied chemistry as an undergrad at Willamette University in, in Oregon, and then worked for a few years in the biotech industry for a company in Seattle called Immunex, which is now Amgen. I stayed in Seattle for my graduate work, also in chemistry, where I learned to use a technology called mass spectrometry, which we'll be talking about later. I took these skills to my postdoc work at Harvard Medical School before being hired as an assistant professor by Steve's predecessor, Mark Israel in 2006. So I've been at Dartmouth for just over 14 years. Mark Israel, there's another person to whom I feel uh, inter eternally indebted for giving me this opportunity. Uh, next slide. So the problem that we work on in my lab is that in cancer cells, growth and proliferation is unchecked and continues when it shouldn't. The goal of studying these signaling aberrations is to better understand them and identify and discover new opportunities to interrupt them for therapeutic intervention. Next slide. Many of you are aware that DNA contains the blueprint for life, some 23,000 genes all encoded in DNA sequence and wrapped up in our chromosomes. But while DNA contains all of that information, only some of it is needed at any given time. RNA transcripts represent a subset of those 23,000 genes, and they're made when they are needed. But it's really the proteins in cells, enzymes, motor proteins, signaling, and structural proteins that do the real work. Next. In other words, if the DNA contains everything that's possible and the RNA describes what's probable, studying proteins tells us what's actually happening in cells. Next. Some of you may have heard about um, studying everything in a genome by sequencing, which is called genomics. Similarly, studying RNA transcripts is called transcriptomics, but it, my lab is a proteomics lab where we study proteins directly. Uh, next slide. In cells, proteins often need to talk to one another, pass instructions along, and so forth. One of the ways proteins signal to each other is by the activity of an enzyme called a kinase. It places a little chemical mark called phosphorylation on a protein, which can dramatically affect it. You turn it on, turn it off, or move it around in a cell as needed. Here I'm showing a protein being activated. This is important when cells receive information about their surroundings, as shown in this example. A receptor protein at the surface sends signals um, inside a cell, which are then relayed, much like um, passing a baton in a relay race, between proteins until the signal can finally be acted upon at some point. Next. The problem is it's really complicated. There's a lot of crosstalk and a lot of signaling going on for various different instructions that need to be managed inside of a cell. Next slide. So I just told you about a case where signaling is really important, receiving cues from a cell's environment. Some of you have may, maybe have heard about a protein that's really important in lung cancer, EGFR. So normally EGFR is required to sense the environment and tell a cell that conditions are just right for growth. Next. But in lung cancer, EGFR is often mutated so that it no longer requires these cues to send signals. It just keeps telling cells um, to keep growing. In this scheme, I'm showing that not only the mutant EGFR protein is involved, but many other proteins downstream. And these are potentially additional entry points that we could use to target and stop this runaway signaling in its tracks. But how do we find those signals? Proteins that are not directly mutated, but play pivotal roles in this signaling in cancer. Next slide. 
This is where a technology called mass spectrometry comes in. So my lab, we use mass spectrometers just like this one, acquired last year through a combination of generous support to the Cancer Center, NIH funds, um, and funds from the college and the medical school to identify these signaling changes. Next. Suppose in this cartoon sample, uh, or example, sample A is from healthy cells and sample B is from cancer cells. By identifying the increase in signaling in this middle light green protein, we might want to consider it for further study. Fine. Next. So finally, none of our work um, would have been possible without the curiosity, um, intelligence, and really hard work of all of my uh, graduate students and postdoctoral trainees. Um, you know, quite honestly, the for me, the thrill of scientific discovery is really only matched um, by, by the excitement I get and, and the joy I get for mentoring students through, um, not only to their doctoral um, degrees, but, but beyond. It, it's what really makes um, my job uh, fun and exciting, so thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next, we have Brock Christensen. Uh, Brock is an associate professor of epidemiology at the Geisel School of Medicine and co-director of our cancer, cancer population science uh, research uh, program. Over to you, Brock. Thanks, Steve. Like Scott, I'm too really happy to be here and um, want to also acknowledge that I've been the benefactor of uh, pilot research funding through Prouty grants that have really helped uh, jumpstart my research program uh, and career at Dartmouth. Before I got here, I worked um, on my postdoc at Brown University where I was studying epidem uh, epigenetic epidemiology of cancer. Before that, I trained um, in my PhD in biological sciences and public health, uh, right next to where Scott uh, did his postdoc at, um, which was the Harvard School of Public Health in Boston. I moved to the East Coast after studying microbiology and immunology as an undergrad uh, at Wisconsin. And today I'm excited to tell you a little bit about um, some of the work we're doing on aging and cancer, uh, where we can ask this question, how old are you really? Next slide. So here, the challenge is that Age is a known risk factor for the development of, of cancer, and it's used in screening recommendations and treatment decisions. And there are environmental and lifestyle exposures that might alter our biological age that aren't yet incorporated into uh, screening and prevention. So this is our opportunity. We hope to use some of these new methods in discerning somebody's biological age to better inform recommendations for screening and prevention of cancer. So age is of course a well-known risk factor for cancer and here I'd like to separate for you the idea of a person's uh, age from, in years from their biological age. And as we saw Scott indicate that DNA is the blueprint for what's going on in cells, in my group we study epigenetic modifications on DNA and this helps determine how the blueprint is interpreted. So these epigenetic marks are what allow one genomic blueprint to result in different gene regulatory programs so that we can have many different cell types that make up our different tissues and different organs. So uh, back please. Researchers uh, have used epigenetic marks on DNA to develop these epigenetic clocks that can tell your biological age. And shown in this graph, biological age measured with an epigenetic clock is on the vertical axis, whereas your chronological age is on the horizontal axis. And so an interesting result of developing epigenetic clocks for biological age is that some people may differ in their biological age from their actual age. So let's say somebody's biological age might be 75, but their actual age is perhaps only 70, indicating that they have a five-year increase in their biological age relative to their actual age. What is interesting about this difference is that it, that difference in and of itself has been shown to be associated with cancer risk. And so we envision using measures of biological aging across the life course to study exposures and behaviors 
that may impact biological age. Next. So one question we're also trying to answer about biological age measures using these so-called epigenetic clocks is whether biological age can be decreased when interventions are deployed. So we have a recent collaboration with a geriatric physician at Dartmouth and a graduate student shown here on the left um, in my lab where we've used this epigenetic measure of biological age at baseline and after only 12 weeks of a weight loss and exercise intervention in older overweight adults. And even in this short period of only 12 weeks measuring epigenetic age, we can, we can observe about, on average about a, a full year of decrease in somebody's biological age with this approach. Next slide. So where we're planning to study biological age in the future is not just to follow up on the opportunity we observed in that interventional approach to decrease biological age, but also to understand why some people might appear biologically older or biologically younger. And that's where uh, we might study the relationship of biological age and lifestyle factors like diet or exercise, as well as somebody's exposures, whether early in life or later, and how they may alter somebody's biological age. So in the future, we hope that additional research in this area can also allow for more precise cancer screening and prevention recommendations. Great, uh, thanks, thanks so much, um, uh, Brock. Um, um, before we move on to our, our final panelists, I wanna acknowledge um, two former Cancer Center directors who are in uh, the, the audience, uh, both Mark Israel and Ross McIntyre. It's such an honor to have both of you uh, joining us. Um, we uh, clearly stand on the shoulders of, of, of giants, and that's very relevant because next um, we have Mary Jo Turk, uh, who co-directs our immunology and cancer immunotherapy research program and just happens to be the O. Ross McIntyre uh, professor. Uh, Ross is a 1953 graduate of Dartmouth College and a 1955 uh, graduate of the medical school. Uh, and he served as director of our cancer center from 1975 until his uh, retirement in 1992. And under uh, Ross's le leadership and uh, subsequently under Mark's leadership, our cancer center grew into one of the nation's premier elite uh, comprehensive cancer centers. Um, so very grateful again to, to both Ross and Mark for their ongoing uh, wisdom. And uh, now I'm pleased to have the McIntyre uh, professor, Mary Jo, uh, present uh, uh, to you today. Uh, take it away, Mary Jo. Wow, thank you, Steve. It's such an honor to be here today um, and to be able to speak to all of you. Um, Mark Israel recruited me here to Dartmouth. Uh, almost 16 years ago this fall, and I can say um, it's, it's such a great honor to hold the McIntyre professorship and the philanthropy and the support of that. Um, it all started out when I came to Dartmouth with a Prouty grant, um, and um, that's, you know, where I, where I had my origins in, in philanthropy support. Um, more recently, we've been um, supported by the Knights of the York Cross of Honor. Um, so many uh, generous donors to our work. Um, my training um, is in cancer immunology. I did my PhD at Purdue University and then my postdoctoral work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some of our recent work and understanding about immunological memory um, in cancer. So if you could advance to the first slide. Um, Really, the challenge that we see ahead of us is that um, we've made a lot of progress that immunotherapy has shown in the past several years now that it can lead to cures in cancer, durable cures for some patients, but the key word there being some, not everyone is cured. And we see this as an opportunity to study those patients who do so remarkably well, so much better than everyone else, and learn from them what type of an immune response they had so we can apply that in designing new therapies that can help more people. 
So on the next slide, um, if you can advance one more, there's a picture of the tumor or cancer. And um, tumors you might think of as you know, cancer cells only, but that's not it. And if you add the next layer here, tumors are surrounded by and infiltrated. They're full of immune cells. And the ones that we're most interested in are T cells. T cells are blood cells that we all have. They attack viruses, and we know now that they can attack tumors. There are different types of T cells, but we know that immunotherapies that are given to patients now can activate T cells to find and destroy tumor cells. And we're trying to understand more about this process. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we study melanoma, which is a skin cancer. Um, and melanoma is a cancer of the pigmented, the pigment producing cells in your skin called mel, uh, melanocytes. And if you can add the next picture to this slide, um, we've been fascinated for years with a, with a very interesting condition that happens in a fraction, about 20% of melanoma patients now that are getting immunotherapies, and it's called melanoma-associated vitiligo. And what's happening in this patient, you can see this is one of our patients from the cancer center who had a remarkable response to um, immunotherapy for melanoma. Their T cells became so activated that they went into the skin and started killing normal melanocytes, which is harmless in this patient. But um, it's an outward sign that this patient has what we call immune memory, T cells in the skin that remember the cancer. And we can move on to the next slide. We've started to study these patients now, and we've studied many of them to this point to understand a few things about what their T cells are doing and what makes them so remarkable in their response. First of all, there are many kinds of T cells. We're trying to understand what type of T cell persists in these patients. And we know now that they're what we call CD8 or killer T cells. Um, where do they go? So we're biopsying um, skin, we're taking tumor and blood from these patients. And what we found is that these really potent really long-lived tumor-killing T cells, these memory T cells, they don't just circulate in blood, but they also go into skin where they live and continue to provide tumor protection. And that's what they do. They produce molecules that are toxic to tumors and they directly recognize tumors. How long do they last? Um, recently, we have found that a population of these cells can last up to nine years in a patient, which is a long time. We're starting to think about now durable cancer cures. Um, so we've been fascinated by this. And if you go into the next slide, um, this work in patients has been so telling, but we are also working in the laboratory. What you see on the left here is one of our mice who came to us all with black fur. We cured this mouse of melanoma and that mouse, you can see the white patches of fur, that mouse also developed vitiligo. They've been a great model for us of these patients that are cured in the clinic. Um, and we've been studying two things on the top. You see the skin, which in patients is where we do see these cells go. And if you can see in green, those little cells, those are the memory cells that are poised in the skin to protect against cancer, and they last there for many years. And we're not just interested in skin because, of course, cancer kills because it metastasizes. So we're also identifying these T cells in metastatic locations, such as the lung and the liver, where we know cancer spreads to. So the goal in all of this is using mice to inform what we find in patients, using patient data to answer the big questions um, Namely, what can we do? How can we treat patients with better immunotherapies to generate these types of responses? And can we design T cells that we can put into patients that will go to the right place and seek and destroy cancer cells? So um, again, so grateful the op for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I'm happy to take questions as we move into that stage. Thank you um, so much, Mary Jo. Um, all of you can see what a joy um, my job is as Cancer Center Director to bask in the reflected glory of our wonderful researchers. I came to Dartmouth um, almost three years ago for Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, in part for the opportunity to work with researchers 
uh, like Mary Jo, uh, Brock, and, and Scott. And so that the spirit of innovation and, and collaboration uh, that, that they exude is palpable throughout our, our cancer center and across all of, all of Dartmouth. So before we jump into the Q&A portion of our program, which I know you are all eager for, I wanted to just take a couple minutes uh, to share a bit more about um, our cancer center and um, our, our vision. Um, if I could have uh, the next slide. So our cancer center is really one of a kind. Um, it's the only cancer center um, that I'm aware of that is literally fully integrated across every nook and cranny of Dartmouth, across a world-class liberal arts college, a medical school, an engineering school, a business school, and a graduate school, as well as an academic health system. And it means that we uh, can literally lead the way in interdisciplinary uh, innovative re research involving the intersection of all uh, five schools of, of Dartmouth and the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health System. Um, as a result of this, we're one of only 51 National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer centers, the elite of the elite. Uh, we're the only one north of Boston and to the east from Buffalo, uh, serving a vast region of northern New England. And we just got the wonderful news um, that the cancer center that Ross uh, started 40-some uh, uh, years ago has now been uh, renewed again with a ranking of outstanding. And so we are now um, entering our fifth decade of continuous NCI designation, literally one of the, mo the country's most long-standing uh, cancer centers. Next slide, please. Um, we're also one of a kind because of our national and international uh, leadership in uh, fields related and so critical to cancer research. Uh, these include um, immunotherapy, uh, tumor genome sequencing, uh, entrepreneurship, and in 2018, we literally ranked number one amongst all uh, comprehensive cancer centers in patient satisfaction. Uh, we uh, treat more than 30,000 patients a year and um, have 200 dedicated uh, cancer uh, specialists providing clinical care, as well as 120 senior scientific investigators from 21 uh, departments all across, as I said, every nook and cranny of, of Dartmouth uh, College. Uh, we bring in 50 million uh, annually in research grants and contracts uh, to Dartmouth. And as such, our cancer center is responsible for a third of all of Dartmouth College's uh, research funding. Next slide. We um, kind of try and think very simply about what it is our cancer center does. And, and, and succinctly stated, we prevent, we cure, and we innovate. Uh, we can advance the slide. Um, and these have, have, have become really our signature initiatives within the cancer center. I wanna just share four of those with you very briefly today. Um, you've heard of precision medicine. Um, we're pursuing at the most sophisticated level precision prevention to eliminate cancer in current and future generations. Next. We also are an international leader in um, the development of next generation immunotherapies. You heard from Mary Jo, uh, the memory that the immune system provides gives us the path towards lifelong uh, cure. And we have decades of international leadership in this space our cancer center was the birthplace of Medarex, that's M-E-D-A-R for Dartmouth, E-X, uh, the company that went on to develop Ipilumumab and Nivolumab, uh, subsequently licensed by Bristol Myers and changing the world, saving the lives of, of uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients. And we continue to be the birthplace of new biotech uh, startups in this space. Next. We also are a leader more broadly in innovation and entrepreneurship. And we recognize that entrepreneurship is the way that we will bring Dartmouth discoveries uh, to the world. We recently received notice that our cancer center amongst all comprehensive cancer centers ranked sixth in the country 
in entrepreneurship is measured by the number of NCI funded biotech startups. We literally punch at the highest uh, ranks of the heavyweight division when it comes to entrepreneurship. And then our fourth uh, uh, priority is clearly in educating the next generation of innovators and leaders in cancer care and cancer research. So our cancer center is the number one provider of research opportunities to Dartmouth undergraduates. Each term, we have more than 100 uh, Dartmouth College undergrads uh, working in cancer center uh, labs. And next, so that we are, um, I'll end just emphasizing our gratitude for the ongoing support we received from the Dartmouth alumni uh, community and other uh, generous supporters. Uh, gifts of all sizes have fueled much of the innovation uh, that you've heard about today. And philanthropy is going to be essential uh, in us continuing to achieve our vision. We were chosen as one of Dartmouth College's four big bets on discovery in the current uh, capital campaign. And each of the uh, priorities I've reviewed with you today has been endorsed by the highest levels of Dartmouth College leadership um, as a priority in um, the, the, the college um, uh, capital uh, campaign. And there's more information here about you, uh, how you can uh, support um, uh, this, this, this effort. So, um, uh, thanks again to to everyone um, I, I, uh, for their support and their uh, participation. Um, and I'd like to now bring all of our speakers uh, back on screen and kick off uh, the Q and A uh, portion. We'll try and get uh, to as many questions as possible. And again, you can give a thumbs up. Uh, to raise the, the priority of a given question in the queue if you find it particularly interesting. Um, so I'll uh, start then with a question that's been submitted for Mary Jo Turk. Mary Jo, if the immune system can be activated to attack tumors, could we create vaccines that would prevent tumors from occurring in the first place? Okay, Steve, I think that's a really good question. And there's been a, a very active field over the last 30 years of cancer vaccines. Um, the question addresses the idea of a preventative vaccine. Can we vaccinate people against cancer? And the answer to that is yes and no. So um, cancer in and of itself is self tissue uh, that's mutated, right? So. For the immune system, it's hard to vaccinate against something that's self, and you wouldn't want to because that could cause autoimmunity if you get an immune reaction against self. That being said, though, some cancers are caused by viruses and other pathogens. And so a great example of a prophylactic cancer vaccine is the vaccine against human papillomavirus, which prevents infection with HPV, which prevents HPV-associated cancers. So yes, in a sense, we've already done that, um, but it's, it's been difficult to come up a, with a prophylactic cancer vaccine for a non-virally uh, associated tumor, if that makes sense. Great, thanks, Mary Jo. Um, the next uh, question is for uh, Scott uh, Gerber, and it's been submitted by Sabrina Skyba, Skyba Lewin. Uh, Scott, do you think that the cancer secretome is equally as valuable as um, intracellular proteomics for understanding the functions of protein in the development and spread of cancer? Yeah, great question, Sabrina. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, what the heck is a secretome? The secretome, right? Yeah. So the, there, there's an ohm for everything: a proteome, a genome, and there's also a secretome. Yeah. So it's a great, great question. The sophisticated one, I'll say. Um, so just to, by way of introduction, the secretome is that space that sits between cells um, that contains all of those environmental cues that I was talking about earlier. Um, and proteins secrete, as the name suggests, um, uh, uh, sorry, cells secrete proteins into that intracellular space in order to communicate with one another. Um, so it's a great question, Sabrina, and I think absolutely the secretome contains a lot of information about um, uh, both the cancer's immediate environment and also the forces that are trying to act on that cancer to suppress it, whether they be immunological um, uh, or, 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 or
growth factors or, or other um, protein uh, effectors. So it's not an active area of research in my lab in particular, but, um, but is, a, I think, a critical component and piece in our kind of overarching battle against, against cancer. Thanks for the question. Great. Um, let's see, the next question um, is an interesting one. Um, are all signaling pathways in cancers bad? Or are there some good pathways that cells might use to um, delay or prevent uh, cancer growth. Anyone want to take that on? I would say that um, cancer cells definitely compete and cells have evolved various mechanisms to um, compete successfully amongst their neighbors and to the extent that those can be harnessed effectively, that remains a potential avenue for development of future therapeutics. I can't bring a current treatment in mind that kind of employs uh, that strategy. Any other thoughts from the panel? Certainly in immunobiology, Mary Jo, Mary jo I was just gonna pass the microphone to Mary Jo, so. Well, Always a good idea. Well, I wanted to comment on your work, Steve, that you published. Um, a couple of years ago now, just showing that as tumors mutate, um, they turn on antigens and they're trying to be insidious, but sometimes what happens is that gives something for something different for the immune system to see. And Steve, you showed that beautifully in your in your paper, um, that, that that's what happens in pancreatic cancer, in fact. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, another question. Um, for uh, Brock, um, is are the changes in epigenetic marks on DNA a carried former carried forward in tumors, or do tumor cells um, rewrite their epigenome somehow? So that, that's a great question, and I think one of the really interesting things about epigenetic alterations in cancer is that. In tumors, the epigenome is incredibly distorted, um, including the marks to DNA that we study in our group. And much more so, in fact, than the genome itself is distorted by mutation. And one of the interesting things about epigenetic alterations uh, to DNA in um, the beginnings of, of cancer formation is that it, we've learned uh, over the past few years, our group and, and many other groups, that it's very, very early that these alterations can occur. And in fact, some of what we might be discerning as increased biological age could be um, some of these early initiating alterations that are maybe the first step and uh, towards the formation of a tumor. Great. Let's see, another question um, uh, to Mary Jo. Can, um, can, act, can T cells that actively target melanoma be transferred from one patient uh, to another? Whoops, we're muted, yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm unmuted. That's a really interesting question. Um, so the answer is no. Um, if you take T cells out of one person and put them into somebody else, two things will happen. One, they will start to attack normal cells in that person because they recognize so many things as different. The other thing is that the T cells in the recipient patient would start attacking those cells too. It's called an allo response, but um, that's not where it ends. So. Um, two things can be done. And one of them, one of my colleagues, Charles Sentman, um, has pioneered a, a technique for manipulating the proteins on the surface of cells, not, not conventional T cells, but what's called a CAR T cell. Um, that stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells, a really um, innovative new type of cancer immunotherapy such that that cell doesn't attack the wrong thing and doesn't get rejected. The other way that you can get around this is, um, so Scott gave a great intro to proteins. Um, T cells recognize their target using a protein on their surface called the T cell receptor. 
you can take the gene for that protein and put it into somebody's own cells. So you essentially change your own cells into cells that can recognize the tumor. So you take somebody's protein, not their whole cell. Um, you take the gene for it and you put it into your cells. And that's been done as well with some success. So there are ways around it, but it's, it's quite tricky. So great question. Yeah, so it's a really exciting recent development in our cancer center that through Charles Sentman's work that Mary Jo mentioned, it's a Dartmouth discovery that is now the first um, genetically engineered allogeneic CAR T cell being evaluated in, in clinical trials around, around the world. Um, um, so re really exciting work being done here. Um, let's see, Clay Simpson had a question. Um, could, could one be a candidate for, I'm reading this, for having one's biologic age be evaluated or stated differently? Brock, can you tell me how old I really am? <laughs> so, so that's a good question. And, and um, I think one of the interesting things about that is that it's a little bit different from uh, how you look on the outside, maybe, right? I mean, if I were to shave my beard, I might look a little bit younger, but uh, my biological age probably wouldn't uh, change much. And um, so the tools exist, and one, um, and there, there's a few different ways uh, to do this. I think commercially, in, in terms of um, sending a sample somewhere and having a company do it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's an option that's uh, coming soon, if it doesn't already exist, but I would, I would also caution that these um, epigenetic clocks are relatively new and there's more than one timepiece. So uh, depending upon how you analyze the data, you, you might get slightly different estimates of your biological age. So one of the things we do is we try to use, uh, not only try to use uh, multiple of these clocks that have been developed to to understand which one might be working best for a given um, situation, but also try to understand uh, how these estimates relate back to the underlying biology at sort of the epigenome scale. And so there's a lot of work yet, yet to be done. Great, thanks Brock. Um, there's a couple uh, questions uh, one, uh, that are similar, um, one from John Stewart and one from uh, Richard J James. Essentially, um, what, what activities or behaviors, Brock, um, might decrease biologic age other than exercise and, 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 and diet? Are there other ingredients in a fountain of youth? Right, so, um, and I think, so exercise and diet are kind of the, the easy ones that you might think first. It's like, oh, okay, well, this is supposed to make you healthy. And, and one of the things that we're excited about doing is trying to understand what that means at the molecular level. And then in terms of other potential uh, exposures, there was a question about antioxidant use. So uh, vitamins and supplements, I think is um, one thing in addition to diet that the, the field is well poised uh, to address because there are existing studies of uh, molecular epidemiologic studies of cancer that have the blood samples in the freezer and they have um, very high quality diet and supplement data that you could use. And similarly, a lot of molecular epidemiologic studies have high quality uh, exposure measure data um, because they may have initially set out to try and understand uh, detailed relationships between uh, say arsenic exposure and bladder cancer risk. Um, or, or many others. And, and these um, could be studied at different time points in life as well. If you have historical data from somebody, uh, whether they were exposed early in life, middle, uh, in middle age, uh, or when they were older, I think um, all of these represent really exciting opportunities uh, to, to address important questions in cancer research. Great. Um, let's see, another question for um, for Scott, so using mass spectrometry, Scott, how do you figure out where the true signals are in all that, uh, in the complexity of, of all that noise? Yeah, another, another great question. Um, so, you know, the, the um, 
I'm basically I'm trying to, to focus um, the experimental design so that we can control as many of these other types of signaling behaviors um, and make them as, as consistent and reproducible so that essentially what we're looking for is related to the, um, to the, to the cancer initiation or to the treatment or to the interruption of a signaling event as much as possible. Um, so it becomes extremely difficult when, when looking, for example, at, at patient tumors just across a large population of individuals, some of whom you know, have uh, differences in diet and some of whom um, may exercise. And this makes their signaling space very noisy. So um, one of the easiest ways to do that, obviously, is in model systems. And so a lot of our model systems are cancer cells in, in, a, in a Petri dish. Um, there are also mouse models of cancer and, and other forms of, um, uh, of cancer models that are much more easy, easily, easily controlled in a sense. Great, thanks Scott. Um, there's a question, when you talk about precision prevention, how early in life are you thinking? Um, and um, is it middle-aged children uh, in utero? And, and it really is all, all, all the above. So, um, when we talk about precision prevention, well, well, most cancer centers focus on on therapy. We have the resources here and the scientific talent here at Dartmouth to really focus on preventing cancer in current and future generations. Brock alluded to uh, Margaret Carragas's uh, groundbreaking work uh, showing um, that environmental arsenic um, uh, when when children in utero, when babies before they were born were exposed to environmental arsenic um, through their mother, that they had an increased risk of later life illness, including uh, uh, cancer. And so uh, when we talk about precision prevention, we talk about developing technologies to literally catalog in an encyclopedic manner every individual's um, known behavioral, environmental, and genetic risk factors for cancer, and then coming up with personal strategies to mit mitigate uh, that, that risk. Um, let's see, G uh, Gary Wine asked a question that seems appropriate for Mary Jo. Uh, given that uh, T cells attack when transplanted, um, how is that different? What, what happens when we hear that a patient has had an immune system uh, or bone marrow transplant. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Gary. Great to see you're here. Um, uh, wish I could see you as well. Um, I think, yeah, as Steve indicated, you're asking about a bone marrow transplant, which is um, has been really been an amazing revolutionary treatment for um, leukemias, lymphomas, and the difference, um, as you note to what I said earlier, if you just give immune cells or this transplant, it, it's going to be rejected, it will attack the patient. Um, in a bone marrow transplant, actually the recipient's immune system is first eliminated. So that means that when that bone marrow comes in, there can't be a response against it and it can't be rejected. However, there's still the issue of the graft, the transplant itself, attacking the recipient's normal healthy cells. Um, that's actually um, often a good thing if it attacks the tumor that's left over, um, but our bone marrow transplant physicians are, are working avidly to find new ways to treat what we call graft versus host disease. So it can be done, it can be done successfully, but, um, but it, it is a tricky proposition. Great, and then um, um, we had a couple questions related to COVID, which I'm sure is on everyone's mind. Alan uh, Grigsby uh, submitted some questions about what, um, what has become the preferred treatments for cancer patients who've been hospitalized for the co coronavirus. And um, fortunately, we've, we've had few examples of that here and nationwide, there's no specific therapy for COVID-19 um, in cancer patients. For those who develop COVID um, pneumonia, we give aggressive ICU care. Um, and then um, our cancer center um, was one of only 20 studies nationally that participated in two 
uh, Gilead pharmaceutical studies of a drug called remdesivir um, showing a benefit uh, for its use for those patients who were already hospitalized with, with a moderately severe um, pulmonary failure uh, due uh, to COVID. Um, and we are also uh, just opened a new, a new trial of a drug called lenzulimab. Um, one of the things about uh, COVID-19 is you clearly need an immune system to fight COVID-19, but it, it often induces um, uh, overactivity, an over-exuberant immune system that contributes uh, to making people sick. And our cancer center was also one of only two cancer centers in the country uh, to be awarded um, um, more than one grant to study uh, COVID-19 in, in a cancer um, um, setting. So thanks for those uh, questions, um, Alan. Um, and I think we just have time for um, maybe one more question. Um, Clay Simpson asked a question, uh, BCG, a standard treatment for bladder cancer, is being evaluated in several countries as a cure or preventive for the virus. Is there anyone on staff uh, studying this? Um, we certainly have lots of clinical trials involving BCG in bladder cancer. New Hampshire, unfortunately, leads the country in terms of having the number one highest incidence of bladder cancer, in part because um, the arsenic that can cause bladder cancer uh, is in very high concentrations in the bedrock of uh, the Granite State um, and uh, also related to frequent use of rural well water in, in, in New Hampshire. I'm not, by the virus, I assume you meet COVID-19, Clay, and I'm not aware of any work being done here on BCG in, um, in COVID-19, but th thank you for that question. Um, so I think we might um, uh, move to, to the wrap up. Um, and again, um, uh, thank uh, Ken and, and Carol. Um, uh, thank the great uh, Dartmouth College class of 1960. Um, thank uh, Ross McIntyre and Mark Israel, um, all of you um, who have supported our Cancer Center so generously and allowed us um, uh, to do the wonderful work uh, that Mary Jo, Brock, and, and Scott shared with you today. And thanks to all three of my dear colleagues uh, for sharing um, their, their expertise um, um, with us. And especially, you know, thank you to our patients and their, their families who every day um, inspire us and, and partner um, with us in our quest uh, to prevent and, and eliminate uh, cancer. Um, so if you were inspired by what you learned today, I'd encourage you to consider uh, joining our virtual Proudy. Uh, this is the 39th uh, year of, of the Proudy, our signature fundraising event uh, that generates funds we use for pilot research grants for our scientists and also for our extensive uh, patient and family uh, support uh, services. And in recent years, uh, the Proudy has raised over three million per year for our cancer center. I literally don't know another cancer center that on a per capita basis is so well supported uh, by our local uh, uh, um, community. It's, it's the equivalent of, of an $80 million plus in endowment. Um, and this year, we're uh, working hard to meet uh, the goal by, by proudying in a virtual uh, manner with safe social distancing and um, uh, but uh, people doing uh, their own uh, custom proudy activities um, uh, near where they, they, they live um, and with their family and loved ones. And so you can learn more uh, and make a donation um, at theproudy.org. And so again, uh, thanks, thanks to all. Um, and just as a reminder, the session has been recorded and within a couple of days, it'll be available um, on the Geisel School of Medicine uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, so thanks again to everyone. Be well, be safe. Uh, uh, best wishes uh, to all, and thank you for joining us here today.